Our guest today served as general superintendent of the Chicago Park District. He also served as chief of staff to Mayor, Chicago Mayor Richard M. Daley. Our guest today is a candidate for Cook County Board President. The Chicago Tribune says our guest today, and I quote, is a, is a serious threat to the moribund Cook County regime, unquote. He is a graduate of Southern Illinois University and the University of Illinois College of Law, where he served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, Cook County Commissioner and candidate for Cook County Board President, Forrest Claypool. Forrest. Cup ready to go here. <laughs> Afterwards, I get that right. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, I'll, I'll only do one introduction. My wife, Dana Lyons, who's with me today. We don't get yeah. Dana, if you wait. We don't get to spend much time together these days, so we force things like this. Huh? Um, <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. It's good to see so many good friends and, and people out there in, in the audience today, and I'm grateful for you coming to hear me speak. I'm here uh, to unlock a big mystery, a mystery called Cook County government. Cook County government is bigger than 29 states. We got $3 billion in annual expenditures, 24,000 employees, and we deal with some of society's most sensitive issues, including public health and public safety. How many of you are aware that the county has a bioterrorism unit? If you weren't, you're not alone, because when you ask the average citizen exactly what the county does, more often than not, they will shrug. For many, it's simply not on the radar screen. Lodged as it is between state and municipal government, county government has long operated in the shadows, which is why the people who run it have gotten away with so much for so long. And, that's, and let me tell you a little bit about what has been going on at the county, while most citizens within the county have not been paying attention unconscionable deaths and abuse at Provident Hospital where politically connected administrators hold sway. Beatings and riots at the Youth Detention Center where, as with Provident, top administrators were hired because they knew somebody, not because they knew something. But even after years of abuse and scandal, President Stroger hired a chief administrator seven months ago who had never worked with kids. The administrative staff, built on a friends and family plan, doesn't know the first thing about working with troubled young people. So instead of rebuilding lives, they're breaking bones. The Forest Preserve District, an absolute gem of 68,000 acres, is managed by a staff that boasts one supervisor for every four workers. I realize that's a very normal ratio in the private sector where many of you work. As a result, the largest public land holdings in Cook County are overrun with invasive species, garbage, and broken equipment. Barbed wire and keep out signs block families from using toboggan slides and swimming pools, while a few privileged families get to live in mansions, forest preserve, taxpayer-owned mansions at cut-rate rents. A 10-time convicted felon appointed head of the county's manpower and training program under pressure from the board president's patronage director, excuse me, a 10-time convicted felon was appointed head of the county's manpower and training pressure program under pressure from the county's patronage director, only to face an 11th indictment, this time for stealing $180,000 in county job training funds. An investigation is still underway as to what happened to $9 million of unaccounted for funds that were under her control. Almost everywhere you look in county government, you find the same sordid story, the triumph of connections over competence, of politics over people. And that's the main reason we all pay $700 million more in taxes than we did 11 years ago and get so much less for it. But the failures of county government, the waste, the abuse, the mismanagement are more than an offense to taxpayers. The failures of county government can literally mean the difference between life and death for those who depend on our vital services. Many of these folks are the working poor for whom the county provides a safety net with gaping holes. 
Nowhere is this more evident than in our scandalous health system. By doing this, we'll return county hospitals to the role of hospitals, rather than overwhelming them with the duties of doctor offices, clinics, and pharmacies. We'll put preventive care and non-emergency services back into the communities. I recognize that many people in Cook County who are lucky enough to have health insurance may think they'll never need this system. But I also know the old adage, never say never. It fits here, particularly in the face of skyrocketing increases in the number of uninsured across the country, with approximately one million uninsured here in Cook County alone. You don't have to be a public health patient to life of our communities. You don't have to be uninsured to know how important it is to be making progress in the fight against diabetes, AIDS, obesity, asthma, and other diseases that disproportionately afflict low-income residents of Cook County. Sadly, we are not making enough progress and we are paying the price in lives lost. Today, the percentage of people in South Lawndale who die from diabetes is 15 points higher than the national average. This disease is preventable. It is treatable. These deaths are preventable. The sad reality is today that if you're poor, you are much more likely to get sick and much less likely to get the care you need. And that is a moral outrage. The gravity of the situation is why I chose to address it today. Because if I continued to talk about the forest preserves, the juvenile detention center, public safety, the Cook County Jail, and all the other county services that are in disarray, this would become the city club dinner. So I hope you'll invite me back so I can lay out my vision of these other institutions and vital areas of county government. I can tell you that we all, sh that I can tell you, however, that th these institutions all share one thing in common. In each area, taxpayers of Cook County are paying too much for what they receive in return. I confronted a very similar situation when I took over the Chicago Park District a decade ago. The Park District, with nine billion in assets, was a string of ghost towns, according to the Chicago Tribune, which ran an investigative series called Chicago's Parks Are No Place to Play. Beautiful historic facilities such as the Humboldt Park Boathouse, Garfield Park Conservatory, and the 63rd Street Beach House were crumbling and nearly deserted. At the same time, the Park District's central office downtown was teeming with bureaucrats. The few programs for children and families were largely a secret. There were no public announcements and no marketing. To get in, you had to know someone to tip you off as to when and where to register. My, fam my favorite story was a story in the Sun-Times about the about the uh, woman, a mother, who called uh, her local park to find out if a program was still being offered and was told that the information was confidential. <laughs> like Cook County government today, the Park District raised taxes year after year but gave nothing in return. Like Cook County today, the Park District was a patronage dumping ground full of payrollers, not patrons. But we changed all that. We reduced a patronage bloated payroll by 25% and fired the loafers, regardless of where they came from. We gave park supervisors new resources and held them accountable, and created dozens of new programs that brought hundreds of thousands of people back into the parks. We hired full-time Chicago police officers to work exclusively in the parks and added millions in lighting to drive out the drug dealers and gangbangers, reclaiming the parks for neighborhoods and families. We spent twice as much on recreation and four times as much on landscaping and added over 200 acres of new parkland, set records for capital improvements, investing hundreds of millions of dollars rehabbing buildings and ball fields, pools and gymnasiums, conservatories and lagoons. And we did all that without raising taxes. The Trust for Public Lands called our reforms astonishing. Wall Street upgraded our bond rating and made it cheaper for us to borrow money. And the University of Virginia wrote a business school case study based on the Park District turnaround that is still taught in business schools today and has been taught locally at Northwestern and DePaul. More important, families were served and taxpayers were protected. That level of service and respect for the taxpayers is exactly what Cook County needs. We need a county government that works for you, not for the politicians. It's your county. It's not theirs. It's your money. It's not theirs. My supporters and friends and family sometimes say I appear angry too often. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's because I am. <laughs> I'm angry to see so many dollars wasted by a government that pleads poverty every year and hits taxpayers again and again. And I'm angry because I see the brutal consequences of a government that puts political payoffs first and service to people last, particularly the most disadvantaged in our population without the clout to speak for themselves. 
And I'm angry because it doesn't have to be this way. But you know, I'm also hopeful. I really am. I'm very hopeful because I believe for the first time in many years, we have a chance in this campaign to put that cynical old style politics on trial and fundamentally change county government. We have a chance to do what I was able to do at the Chicago Park District a decade ago, take that money the people entrust to us and spend it responsibly for their benefit and not our own. Among other things, this will allow us to create a county health care system that will be a true lifeline for children and families that it was meant to be. You see, the shadow is lifting from county government. The mystery is unraveling. More and more people are learning the truth, and the truth shall set us free. A few weeks ago, Mike Quigley and I made a pact to join our campaigns and reform this county on behalf of the people who pay the bills and need its services. Mike's decision to join our campaign ranks among the most selfless political decisions ever made in Cook County, a rare example of political courage in an environment too often marked by self-interest. And I want to thank Mike for being here today and lending his support to this campaign. I know we're facing a tough and determined opponent who's eager to hold on to the empire that he's built. And obviously in his mind, we're the barbarians at the gate. But, for, but I also know that power rarely surrenders itself without a fight. But I'm convinced that on March 21st, people across the county will choose a future of hope and progress over the politics of the past. And this movement re for reform will have its day because it's hard to stop a change whose time has come. Thank you so much for having me here today, and God bless you all. Hi, Forrest. Hey, how are you? Um, Good to see you, Christy. Uh, Christy Weber, Christy Weber Landscapes. Go Forest. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly tell us what you're going to do. Cook County was the first to lose the minority program. Um, they did not defend well, and what are we going to do to move forward to get uh, minorities back in contracting for the forest preserve? Everything. There's, there's so many, there's so many uh, scandals and problems to talk about today that I obviously didn't have time to mention that one, but it's a very important one. Um, just a few years ago, 44% of all construction contracts went to minority and women-owned firms. Today, it's 4% because a federal court struck down the decree uh, calling the law unconstitutional. The uh, same thing happened at the city of Chicago. Within one year, Mayor Daley had convened a task force, hired expert witnesses, had public hearings, and had passed a streamlined law to put a new ordinance back on the books which was uh, constitutional. Four and a half years later, Cook County under President Stroger has failed to do so. And as a result, the number of contracts that are being given out to minority and women-owned firms is now 4%. Uh, if I'm elected president, I will put together the task force that President Stroger, uh, I'm president, I mean, Mayor Daley, excuse me, did, will pass a new ordinance uh, to rectify that shameful situation and open up contracting opportunities to all in Cook County. I'm Joyce Sachs, and I'm on the board of City Club. I asked Ed Mazur and Bill Hood at my table if, while I was in California, if anything has happened with the old Cook County Hospital building. And I guess nothing has. Do you have any plan for it? Any thought as what we could do? Well, the reason nothing's useful? happened is because the board has blocked President Stroger from tearing it down. It's a, it's a landmark, architectural landmark. The desire of the board, as well as myself, to preserve that architectural landmark. Uh, if I'm elected, we will preserve the, the facade of that facility, we'll keep the architecture intact, and, and, and build around it or within it, but maintaining that historical facade as part of a campus redevelopment that includes additional medical offices, uh, retail, potentially retail and residential. It's something that should go out to, a, obviously, to, to a bidding process and it's where we get ideas, on, uh, but, but eventually that will, that will happen. But nothing has happened because of the stalemate on the board over the, um, over the demolition of that hospital. Hi, my name is uh, Leonard Lund Dominguez and, and Truth in Advertising. I'm also an independent Democratic candidate for 7th uh, Cook County Commissioner District. Uh, my question is, today, looking, reading today's paper and reading previous articles about um, uh, the Sheriff's Department, about the issue of uh, all the need, all extra guards that are needed, 
And I'm wondering uh, what are some, the letter to editor today from the John Howard Association said there are alternatives to simply just raising the budget to, to find uh, more jail guards. And I'm wondering what, what those alternatives might be. He said he's going to bring them up in a report to the commissioners sometime. I wonder if you might have some ideas on that. Well, I think we have to, obviously we have no choice. The federal judge is ordering us to add jail guards, which is why it was m that much more remarkable uh, that President Stroger put none in this budget and why a federal judge uh, remonstrated with uh, him and other commissioners at a recent court hearing. We have to find the money to meet the federal decree. Uh, I do believe there's savings to be had. Uh, I put an amendment in last year to begin the civilianization process in the sheriff's office, moving paid law enforcement personnel from behind desks, just like the city of Chicago did you know, 10 years ago. To, add, to free up bodies for that purpose, but we have no choice under this edict. I think we need to do it in a responsible way for the taxpayers, but when a federal judge is, is, may threaten us with a million dollar a day fine if we don't act soon on that, on that mandate. Uh, Bob Manor with the City Club member. Uh, given that the county's pay scales preclude attracting enough pharmacists to meet what really are the legitimate requirements at County Hospital to crank out prescriptions, is it possible legally to contract out prescription services the way Medicaid does, get the best possible price and let people fill prescriptions in their neighborhoods where they can be done efficiently, et cetera? I believe it can be. We, we hear conflicting information as to whether or not um, local outlets or, or those sort of arrangements can still receive um, the federal discounts that we received on pharmaceuticals, but the, the big chains ensure us, the Walgreens and the like assure us that that is the case. Uh, and I think there's also opportunities for, the, for smaller community-based pharmacists in that process, and that's something I would want to explore because the, there were hearings earlier this year uh, at the county which, which documented that the waits for pharmaceuticals, sometimes 8 or 12 hours, sometimes days, literally days to receive uh, prescriptions, sometimes multiple trips to receive those prescriptions. Uh, that has to change, and, it, and I don't, do not believe in a highly centralized bureaucratic environment that is going to be uh, effective. And, and what is the pay range difference? I understand it's somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars a year. Is that close? You know, I don't know. Thank I do you. not know. I'm sorry. Hi, Commissioner Jerry Murphy. Uh, do you see a outlook for toning down the reliance on home rule taxes to raise enough money by the Cook County? Well, uh, there will be no new taxes if I'm elected president of the board. Period. Uh. <laughs> And as, I, and as I said before, I, I, it's not an empty promise because I have a proven track record in that area. When I left the parks after five years of reform and progress, property taxes were actually a little bit lower. So I know how to do it. I have the experience to do it, and I'll bring that experience to the, to the office. Hi, Grant Linsky with City Club. If uh, City Club offered the opportunity, would you debate President Stroger in front of us? Absolutely. We're anxious to debate President Stroger to his credit. Um, yeah. <laughs> President Stroger to his credit has now twice uh, told the, uh, the, the press corps that he will debate, and I'm anxiously looking forward to it as often as possible. So. Good. I'm hoping yeah. Paul Green will set it up. <laughs> Kathy Posner, a smoker. Are you going to be voting <laughs> for the... Uh, yeah, I wanted... Uh, what, what Mr. Claypool just said that he will not be voting, he will not have any new taxes when he becomes president. So I want to know, are you voting for the uh, cigarette tax increase of a dollar a pack? I, I opposed the last cigarette tax increase, and um, I think the problem is, is that President Stroger is using the cigarette tax as a placekeeper, essentially, for higher, other higher taxes. Each year, he's added higher taxes to the, the payroll. He tried again this year. First, he floated a property tax, then a sales tax, then a hotel tax. Finally, when he realized that the board in an election year was not going to support those taxes, he went with the, what he thought was the most uh, palatable tax, or the one that had least political resistance, which is a cigarette tax. And I think we have to first go after, the, the, be sure we're as efficient and as effective as we can be before we turn to new, to new revenues, and that has not been done. In addition to that, I think it's hypocritical because two years ago, Commissioner Quigley, Commissioner Suffern, and I and others introduced an amendment uh, to ensure that the money from the cigarette tax was put into escrow uh, to fund health care and tobacco-related diseases, and President Stroger led the fight to defeat that amendment. So that money was not used for health care. It was used for general bureaucracy and to just sustain this giant patronage empire that we see today. Uh, and I think if, if, if there's going to be a cigarette tax increase, it ought to be after we've done everything we can to make the government as efficient as possible, but also that money has to go into health care. It cannot be used for general purposes, and that remains to be seen. Thank you.
Thank you. All these changes, no new dollars. Where does the money come from? Well, the money comes from the same place that I found at the Park District. The, 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 the county budget is, is very similar to the Park District of, of, of 1993. It is layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy. It is assistance and deputy assistance and assistance to deputy assistance throughout the structure. And that's done on purpose. It's done because those are high paying, do nothing, unaccountable, paper pushing jobs that uh, can be filled by p people with political connections. That's what the government's been about. It's what it's always been about, going back to George Dunn. This is nothing new to, uh, to John, John Stroger. Uh, and uh, you have to come in the same way I did at the parks. Uh, I, was ha I was fortunate enough through Mr. Merberg was sitting here who was my general counsel and head of the lakefront, uh, had a connection at McKinsey and Company. They came in pro bono and helped us restructure, realign, streamline, and make that a, an efficient operation and reprogram those dollars for kids. In the case of the county, we're going to reprogram it to health care. Uh, I could, we could sit here and give examples all day, but I'll give you two quick ones. One is the the, each hospital has its own bureaucracy. We have th we're one health bureau, but we have three hospitals, each with its own PR department, legal department, HR department, finance department, all with ratios of administrators to staff, three to one that of not-for-profit and private health care institutions. Um, uh, we have overtime. If we, had this, if, if, we, if, we had, if we consolidated that into one, we need to consolidate all that into one administrative structure at normal staffing ratios. And, and then if we had the same overtime management as the city of New York, that would free up $40 million a year just like that every year, year in, year out. So there's a lot we can do to make this government work for taxpayers, but also expand health care for people who need it.